welcome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank Here. you guys. <laughs> What's up? Uh, welcome. Thank you for having all of us uh, AT aliens in DC <laughs> this week. Um, first, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, to my left, we have Coach K, founder and COO of Quality Control, a record label I'm sure you guys have heard of. We have Miss Ethiopia Habtamarium. Did mm -hmm. I pronounce it right? All right. Thank you. <laughs> and this lady is the president of Motown Records and the EVP of Capital Music Group. Yeah, you guys, yeah, you can clap it up for that. <laughs> <laughs> and to my right, I have the legendary Mr. Mark Byers, who is the general manager at Motown Records. We have a full house. So today, we're going to be talking about building and maintaining black businesses with a couple of really incredible black business owners and just business owners in general. Um, I want to start out with you, Coach. <laughs> um, how do you, let's just talk about what, what makes it a black business over just being a business? And, and do you take pride in calling your business a black business? Or where are you at with that uh, okay. term? Yeah, we take pride in calling ourselves a black business. I mean, it's very hard for black businesses, black owned, black ran um, businesses, just because in our communities, you know, at, at some time we had those, and then they were kind of stripped away or taken apart. You know, like gentrification, for instance, you know, where there were a lot of buildings that, that we own. because of situations in the community, you know, it's like they, may, they bring the community down so they can come in and buy, mm -hmm. you know, and take it to build it back up. You know, with, when, when that starts happening, then the source of the old black businesses that, that at, at the time that was running things kind of went down, you know? So when we started our company, we were so big on, that being an all black and all black ran business. I mean, to the point where our attorneys and, and accountants and you know, like if we don't if we don't if we don't support ourselves and, and our own, then we're not gonna grow. Okay. You know, so that was a big part. Yes, uh, I think the most incredible part about this panel is that you guys all work together. And one yes. thing about running a black business, sometimes you're always looking up for a handout or a leg up from somebody else that doesn't right. look like you. Right. And in your particular situation, Ethiopia, you were able to create this partnership between QC and Motown, a black business that you're running. Mm -hmm. um, what does it feel like to be able to partner with someone like that and to I, give those opportunities to? I, honestly, it was really amazing because I got been in this, I've been in this business for 22 years and, and building, building my repertoire and our business I always had to run in these offices, you know, if I, I feel like I had to run in these offices to take my business to the next level, you know, whether it's another bigger label, you know, at the time I were managing artists, so I would build a brand, or well, I call artists brands. I would build a brand, which is an artist, and I would take them to a label and I would sign a deal. So once we, in 2013, we started Quality Control, we were big on creating our black business, right? and big on independence. But as the business started changing and it went from one, from a download to a stream, it came very, very global. So at this point, me and my partner, you know, we're like, you know, in order for us to sustain and really take it to the next level, we're gonna, we're gonna have to have a partner that's global, that has a, a, a global business, a bigger platform. So we started running around to labels and meeting with labels. No one would see our vision. No one. And so we just kept going. And then one day, Ethiopia, which is a really good friend of mine, we've been friends for a long time, I always admired and watched everything she done. And she built a lot of different, I watched her build other black businesses, you know, throughout the community, throughout Atlanta, throughout, you know, just through producers and, and writers and people that she signed. And she called me and we had a conversation. And from that one conversation, I knew this was the right, this was the right place. Not even the right place, but 
just being in business with her. And then at the time, she's running a company, Motown Records, which was a black business that growing up, I'm growing up and to the day, I still model my, my thoughts and my ways of how we built our company around Motown, because that was the first one, you know? And uh, it just made perfect sense, like for real. <laughs> and, and from my perspective, you know, I became president of Motown in 2014. And at the time, Coach just mentioned that, you know, we were going from downloads to streams, but the industry, you could have a number one record at Urban Radio and it did not equate to sales. It didn't equate to downloads. So our business and the way hip hop and R&B music was looked at inside of the industry was you can't make any money there. We knew that wasn't the truth, right? And so here I am stepping into a role at Motown Records and within the first year it was like, uh, cricket, you guys aren't really selling records, blah, blah, blah. It was a problem. <clears throat> Um, when I got to Motown, one of the things I wanted to do was to tell the story of Motown. Because when you think about what those black people from Detroit were able to create with the incredible artists and songs and executives, it wasn't just one person, it was a whole team of people. They created music that changed the world and connected people from around the world. So it was tough for me being in the business and feeling like we had to prove ourselves again. So I thought it was important to tell that story, but to do it with the right people to use Motown as a platform for other black, black entrepreneurs that were living in the spirit of what Barry Gordy and his team did in Detroit. And I'm from Atlanta originally, and I've known Coach K for years and admired him as a manager, as a creative. I mean, he's, you know, a legend. And um, I was actually in a dual role at the time at the, at, a pub, at the publishing company, which is where my background was. and. Um, I sat with him about a publishing deal for quality control, and literally in that meeting, I'm with him and P, and I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. We, you got, we need to do a deal for QC here. It all connected for me in that moment. Now, mind you, at the time, Migos. Wasn't, yeah, Migos was in another whole deal. Yeah. Like, we, we, we was in a previous deal, so she knew. This was, was, was really cold that I really loved about her. She, she knew, okay, if I do a deal with QC, it's only gonna be for the artists that's there now or the ones to come, because Migos was already signed to another deal that we were working on trying to get them out. So we signed the deal with Motown, and Migos didn't come for a year and a half later. No, it was almost two, 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 and, a half, like, yeah. two and a half years later. So I brought it up to, to say that because I really bet on Coach. Exactly. I didn't know his partner, Pete. You know, he was just quiet in the meeting for the first time. He was learning, you know what I mean? But I bet on Coach because I knew the work that he had put in, and it was about investing in the people you believe in, which I'm a big believer in, you know what I mean? And so we went on this run together. The first thing we did was OG Maco, and the first two years of the deal was extremely tough. It was. <laughs> we had, it, was it was really tough until... Coach called me and said he found Yachty. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, but it's been beautiful, beautiful for me, and I think that we've been supportive and deliberate in really growing quality control as a brand and entity as well because it will inspire the youth of today. And to show that what Motown did 60 years ago, what QC is doing today, you'll better be able to understand that we continue to do it over and over again and that it's possible. And so that was something that... Um, inspired me as well, like it's purposeful work, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm really proud of everything they've done, what we've been able to do together. Um, we just getting started too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like literally. It's, we just came off a run in Europe, yeah. Say. Yeah, we just came off a global run in Europe that was amazing. Like we went to meet with every, every one of our partners in every big territory, whether it was UK, we went to Paris, we went to Germany and Stockholm. And it really just opened up my eyes. Like, you know, from, you know, since we got social media, you can kind of see what's going on around the world. But until you step there and actually see what's going on, you'll have a clear understanding. And our brand is so, I mean, just the work that we put in, our brand is so just. Potent. Oh, it's like, cause it, I mean, it's, it's, it's like this. It's like, if, if we in DC now, there's some kids in, 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 in Paris right now, right? that's in the community 
it's going through the same struggle and the same thing that's going on here. So it's a connection there. So my job in Ethiopia, what we figured out from all is how do we connect that now, mm -hmm. you know? So you're going to see it. <laughs> She's about to be so global. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you, Foreign exchange. you recently Foreign exchange. joined Motown. Mm -hmm. um, you're in the building. You, can you explain the importance of keeping your people around you in the building, in the room? Uh, so like Coach Kiss. Excuse me, like Coach said, making sure that people understand the vision and continuing to push the vision and not allowing anybody, no matter what they look like, to change what you guys know will work. Yeah. I mean, you know, reality is like, I haven't worked in corporate since 95. I worked at Atlantic um, from 95 to probably 96 and a half. And a lot of it was, was because of the frustration of people not understanding is why I left. And I left to start my own business. Um, so that's why I understand what Coach is doing, because I had a very similar business with my Black Friday company that had all the state property stuff, and Eve, and Philly's Most Wanted, and all that stuff. And he was a friend also from, you know, I had some producers at Universal Music Publishing before she went to Motown, you know, and Coach and I have done stuff as well. So we've got probably 15 and a piece mm -hmm. of, of years, but, you know, looking at what they were building, you know, I understood that it was an important time um, to also come in and help them build and protect what was there and keep the authenticity, you know, because at every angle, everyone has to understand what the message is and what the purpose is. So while he's in Atlanta traveling, while he's in corporate meetings and traveling and stuff like that, my job is to understand what was built and what was being built and keep it intact. Um, so. It's been fun. I moved to LA from Philly, which most people never thought I'd do. <laughs> but I did it for family and I did it for purpose. You know, when you look at this Motown brand, you know, I watched Philly International get built. That was the brand after Motown. And to see where everything is going now, it's like I would be selfish not to jump in when I know I have something to offer. And I also would be selfish as a friend not to see the areas that's needed and actually come in and help to play my part. So it's a good time, mm -hmm. you know, more than anything. It's a, it's a really good time for us. And I really think it's just the beginning. You know, we're kind of catching our stride. We had a very aggressive fourth quarter as soon as I came in. <laughs> Thanks to Coach and, you know, control the fourth. It was stressful but good. And it was like it got me kind of reacclimated with, like, what the flow is because I hadn't really done music in probably five years. Um, before coming back to work with them. So it's been fun, but it's purposeful, you know? And we all speak the same language. We care about each other. This is not just about work, you know? And we understand the mission. So very interesting, but more importantly, interested in the way it's going. Because I know it's going to be much stronger. Um, and this question is for anyone. Um, when you guys were building businesses, when Motown was first built, there was no Google. <laughs> and everyone was just doing what they felt was right, taking risks and taking chances. And now we're speaking to a room full of people who have so much access to information. Is there any tips that you guys can give about how they can use that information to build better business faster, be more effective? Just they have so much access. And I feel like sometimes it's ignored as if you can't just get on your phone. and Or it's overwhelming, right? Right. Yeah. How do you, how can they move through that to be able to do what you guys are doing now and it not have to take, you know, 10 years in the business, 22 mm -hmm. years in the business, how can they get moving and fail fast and do it right? I say, one, understand what your business is and who you're talking to. Um, two, don't get caught up in the minutia of everything that's happening out there because it, it may not pertain to your business. You know, I think I went off of social when I came to Motown just to focus harder and not put myself in position to watch all of the crap and hear all of the noise and really focus on what it needed to take place for our goals. And I think a lot of folks need to kind of pay attention to that and look how many man hours you're putting in on social that means nothing to what you're actually doing um, and get disciplined and serious and focused. Like, that's the whole key is like, how are you gonna challenge yourself to focus on what the real goal is? Or do you look at someone else's business and feel like you're competing against that? which you're not, the competition is against yourself to get better every day. It's not what no one else is doing. 
If you look at quality control, you look at Motown, even in the starter days, like this is actually setting the pace. And when you look at how many artists have adopted to their sound, you know, around the world at this point, you understand what focus and on what who you are really means because you can set trends. You know, so I think social is overrated in a lot of cases, especially if you don't know how to use it. You can get abused by it. It could be a rabbit hole. You can be an emotional wreck thinking that you're not moving fast enough, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And this whole thing is a marathon. It's as, much, as much as people want to like jump in and be successful right away, you know, I always use the analogy that, you know, I like the oven better. You know, if it's the microwave, I could get a phone call <laughs> and walk away for three, four minutes and come back and the food is cold. But if I do the oven, I could walk away for probably 30 minutes and come back and the food is still warm enough to eat and be good. So you just have to make that choice of what it is that you want and what you want it to be. And then also like pay homage to people that have done it before you and see what were the disciplines that they adapted to, how long did it take it to happen, things like that, and what kind of people they had around them. Because with us, as African Americans, we like to be comfortable and have people that we like around us versus people that can execute real stuff. Mm -hmm. So those things are disciplines too that your family or your friends might be mad because you don't have them in your business, but it might not be for them. And if they've never shown the passion of being it before, don't bring them in it. Because you're asking for, you know, your ass to get whipped, you know, and ruin friendships, mm -hmm. you know. So I suggest don't look for the comfort zone. You know, success is all about being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know. Yeah. Facts. Hard. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Coach, I'm going to bring it back to you while we're talking about us millennials and the phones. We, we use a lot of data now because we have it, which is right. great. You know, if a player can shoot from a certain place on the court at a certain percentage, that's where we're going to put them, and we stick by that. You are running a business a lot off of gut still. No doubt. And then it works, and it's important. So can you, can you explain how to keep that, you know, stay data-driven but still believe in yourself? I mean, it's, it's, it's like I, I always tell people, I grew up playing sports, so my whole business structure is built around sports, camaraderie, <laughs> and planning. You know what I'm saying? Like, for a game, we practice all week. Oh, and we, and we, had a, we, had a, we had a plan, right, that we stuck by and we watched film and we watched other players. That way we can get to the week. So when we got to the game, we we're prepared, right? So in, in, in this business, like, with social media, everything is moving fast and the information is, is there, but you still have to use the traditional techniques. You know, like, when we came into business, people was laughing at us because everything was so... Uh, you know, it was like, go online, buy a banner, you know? And we were still like, no, we're going to get these posters. We're going to put these posters up, and we're going to get these flyers, and we still, you know, we're going we're gonna to do the internet stuff, but we're still going to do the, flip, the, groundwork. the groundwork to cover the ground, you know what I mean? So with, with doing that, you know, we built relationships, and you actually touch people. It wasn't just, you know, you know like, most millennials today can't really sit down, no disrespect, can't sit down and have a real conversation. Yeah. You know, it's all through text message. You yeah. know what I mean? So if you're not if you're not walking up to are you not, you know, that's how you that's how you build. That's how you, you have, you know, conversation. Yeah. So we can't like I mean I, I mean I'm I'm really big on like guerrilla marketing and yeah. still doing that. So like we we kept it traditional, you know, and still being smart and listening, you know, like I think the reason I connect to the youth so much is because I sit and listen to them. You know what I'm saying? And, and I share advice. You know, I'm like an open book. You know, so it's like you still listen and you give them jewels and you take the jewels from them. You know what I'm saying? That, that way it spreads. Yeah, it's funny, like, for, for people to act like gut is risky. Yeah. Like, <laughs> gut, gut from somebody that's in the culture is as valuable as this new conversation of data like you know data is a gut too right because you're seeing the information right well, there data and like, is oh, really reading other people yeah, operating yeah, it, off it, of their gut well, off of the gut they're, they're off of the gut yeah right. one million percent and it's like if you're in it gut is it if you're not in it gut is a risk exactly you know um data is a risk if you if you don't have gut because but, you're reading after so much stuff after the gut made its choice you don't actually know where it happened or how it happened. You just see 
like this line of area, but it's not really pinpointing what really took place. So if you live just by data alone, you're going to lose for sure. It's for sure. It's risk. It's, it's gut, but it's ri you know in any business, you know it's, it's risk taking. But it's risk taking with a plan. You yeah. Know if you have a plan, like I tell everybody, write your shit out, write it down, you know, so you can see it, you know, and then when 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 all the problems come, they present themselves to you. You know, you got this plan. You're like, okay, you check this off. You check this off. So when there when there when there are problems or or there's like road, let's say a roadblock or a hump that you got to get over, and you you already experienced that or you already did that, you can actually see it. Like, you know what? Okay, now I know that was the that move is not right. So let me move this way. You know, but it's it's all it, it really is like the the gut feeling is really taking a risk with a plan. It's, I mean, it's a plan look, behind the risk. But you can, get, you can get the data and yeah. the information exactly. to really like change your strategy if you need to. Da data is absolutely helpful. Yeah. You can understand what markets people are really engaging with your music or that artist. If you put a song out and it's not really reacting, you might need to go put in more work in that market. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, you got to use the information for what you want to achieve, you know? But at the end of the day, it comes down to what Mark and Coach were saying. It comes down to really believing in something, having yeah. a plan for it, and then putting in the work to execute it. But then you can read the data and information to adjust your plan as needed, which we use that information all yeah. the time. But you look at, like, gut, for instance, right? You know, you being from Atlanta, Coach being from Atlanta, you seeing, like, the Gucci mans, the Jeezys, the consistency that when it kind of fits the aesthetics of what he does, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. So given that shot, it's not a risk. It's the, you know, like, it's just a matter of time that yeah, if like he gets he the does. right product, what's going to happen because right. you've seen this happen before. And betting on somebody that looks like you, that you know do it, it's not a risk. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's actually something you're supposed to do because most of the time in our business, it's more on the fact that what talent do you have? It's not about the talent that you are. It kind of bypassed in the past, and I feel like these opportunities break that mold because it wasn't about the artist's talent, it was the executive talent that was bet on. That's you right. know, and it's very rare that as black people, the executive talent is bet on. It's always about you coming to the table with something new. When you're getting another hot act, and then we, can, we should put something together, but if we've got the, if we got the stuff in place, well, people understand we have the infrastructure, we could take shots every day. But if you don't have the infrastructure and you know someone's looking for a deal, then you've got to play a very, a very risky game of maybe signing this person, not being able to sign this person because you don't have a deal in place already, other people bidding against you. But in this case, he was given the infrastructure to be successful. And that's what we're supposed to do. It's, sure. We're supposed to supply people what it takes to be successful. Yeah. Hey, that's so real. I, I, one thing I can say about this sister right here, like, I built a lot of artists and brands, but until we started business, she really, she believed in me so much that it, it, it made me say, you know what, oh shit, you are that dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, for real. <laughs> like, like, I push him all the time. No, no, I'm she like... pushed me all the time yeah. and, and to the point where I start believing, like, oh shit, okay. Because, you know, like, <laughs> Like, you'll, you'll, you'll build a brand or artist and you break them and then, you know, maybe a split happens, you know, or something. And then, you know, you're kind of like, shit, okay, what am I going to do? But then you go back and you do it again, you know? <clears throat> but you're building, these other, you're building these brands, but you're not building your brand. But when me and Ethiopia, like, when we got together, like, I, it just hit me right there. <laughs> that you, may, you gave me the confidence to be like, oh, oh, I'm the shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know coach I got has been, this. Coach has been the shit in the business for a long time, and what I knew was that you probably weren't getting the other opportunities because people would rather hold you back out of exactly. fear when they see people that are great as yeah. opposed to empower them to fully live out their greatness. Yeah. And that was, a, you know, that was and a big part it's, of it, it's too. black plight. Like, we have to be honest. Like, Jim Crow worked. You know, if we be honest, it worked. And we don't give roses, like, while we're standing. And we got to get off of that. You know, we let's miss a lot of opportunities by saying, man, he was so dope. But why didn't you tell that person that while they were standing, while you knew them, <laughs> while they were in the thick of it? It's like, we got to break that mold of killing kings and queens in the, in the process of success and figure out how to help. You know, figure out how to learn from each other. 
you know, so we've got a lot to learn, like as black Americans, so to speak, when it comes to, you know, how do we learn how to be in business? Because most of the time we don't come from being entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We don't have areas that teach us entrepreneurialism in the areas, in the neighborhoods. Because even as, you know, economically, as like this whole gentrification thing takes place, it's because the entrepreneurs left. You know, so the examples of, you know, what you can be sometimes is not there because people are like nine to five, you see them come home, but you don't see them in the neighborhood building a real business. So even now you might have a Latino in the neighborhood with the bodega, you might have a Chinese person in the neighborhood with the food and short market spot, but not enough of us. And a lot of it I hear with friends say, look man, I opened a business in the neighborhood, my people don't support me. But you support a foreigner. That's right. So it's like, we gotta look at that and correct that. And if you're making that mistake, change it. it you know, because I, I forgot the rate that our dollar leaves, but our dollar never circulates in our neighborhood. See what I'm saying? It doesn't circulate long enough for us to scale. So we have to get better. Most, most people, their, their dollar circulates inside of their, and, their core And we gotta get out of my state that as black people, we all want to hook up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, we got to get off, like, off that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and actually going back to when you were asking the question about social media, et cetera, yeah. I feel like that's a lot of like, well, what come that's across what through social media, everyone like, can you just give me, can you give me, can you give me? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, what work have you really put in? Yeah, yeah. right. I think social media is actually really useful if you don't, if you use it and don't let it use you. You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, if you get caught up in this idea of just, you know, wanting people to perceive you a certain way, yeah. as opposed to like really being someone that is about their business or about putting in the work, because we all see that and recognize that wherever we go. We, we know who's just putting on for the gram and who's really in these rooms mm -hmm. making shit happen, you know, adding value to an artist, adding value to any business or event or whatever they're working on. So just know how to use it to tell your story, whatever that is, or, yeah. or execute your plan. Um, I think that's super important. Yeah, I wanted you to touch on too, while we're in this room, we're talking about black businesses, and mm -hmm. I think there's always a lot of pressure on everybody to be an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur, start a business. Mm -hmm. And if you can speak about your role, of yeah. bring, you, are, you are a business in yourself as yeah. a black woman. Yeah. And you bringing the culture and you bringing black business into a corporation yeah. is so important. Instead of you starting your own thing, you right. have your own Which, thing. Which, I here. mean, I definitely thought yeah. about before. <laughs> yeah. And no, because being inside a corporate structure can be really difficult, yeah. especially when you feel like you're having to convince people over and over again. But it's a part of my purpose, because if I wasn't there, who would do it? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I wasn't there to really support the talent, you know, sign and identify things early and help in developing them or give, you know, a team like QC yeah. an opportunity and um, my boy Dre from the DMV, his company as well. Um, so, yeah, Dre? Dre the mayor, <laughs> yeah. But it's about supporting people that, that actually do it. And if I wasn't there, I don't really know many that would. And, and this isn't, no diss to like my colleagues in the industry, but everyone is really in the cycle of just reacting to what's already moving, as opposed to like knowing where the, what the next yeah. movement is, you know what I mean? And you bet on people, but you also bet on the talent of the people. You know what their gifts are and you help to support that. So, um, you know, while I was doing publishing, I also did management as well, and I managed an artist for a while, and that was just for me to get my own training. I was in one sector of the business, working with songwriters and producers, but I wanted to understand how to put tours together, videos, branding deals, et cetera. That was just for my own growth, because I got a little bored, you know what I'm saying? But I had a separate management company, and I did that for years. It was just good knowledge for me to prepare me for this, but I recognized how important it is. And I think it's important that across all these industries and businesses to have people that understand that will help bring each other sure. in and support each other and, and know how to translate that. Because yeah. I know you you trust decisions being made if you're not in the building because these people are there Almost to protect definitely. you mm -hmm. in Most the definitely. room. And so there's a place for black people in business, whether you're being an entrepreneur or you're inside the building, mm -hmm. helping other entrepreneurs. I mean, when I first came over to the building, he would tell you, I walked on the floor and said, man, we got to get some more black people. <laughs> no, seriously. It's just, yeah. it was... At the time in our company, there were 
None. It was, like, it was like me and three people. Yes. Um, and now if you come in the building. We're all there. <laughs> We're all there. There's a ton of color. Like yeah. you know, and that's something to be, I'm prideful about that too because <laughs> We're making real change happen. You know, there's a lot that comes with that because you're educating people on our business and our culture, and you know that can be a little tough over time too. But we're getting there, and we're really, you know, creating a diverse environment that can really support our music and take it to the world in a bigger way. Yeah, I, I feel like I heard a lot coming up that people say, oh, well, you don't want to just be put in a box that you work mm -hmm. on black music or that you do urban. And I never really had a problem with that. I'm like, I love black people. I love black music. Yeah. And and you guys, well, see, having been in the business for so long, you have always been about that and proud of it. See, that, they created that box. See, that's that box to control the data, you know yeah. what I'm saying, or what you, the, what you see. But once, you know, like, people didn't understand streaming. It took, it took a minute for, for it to catch up. But with streaming, it gave the fans straight access. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a controlled distribution where, okay, I got to go to this store, and you know, and what if you can't get to the store? You know what I'm saying? What if it, the store in your neighborhood don't sell this? You know? But when it came to streaming, it's right there at your hand. So the the the, the fan had direct to it. So once they have control that's in their hands, now they can control what they want to hear, how they want to hear it, when. So. Here, here's black music, just like, ah. You know what I'm saying? Right. We, we already the culture, so if the culture's controlling it, then shit, the stats are just gonna go up. Yeah. So once that start happening, it's like, yeah. you know, there's no more yeah. uh, box. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, Listen, if you, you look, look at, at it now, you got a kid, little Nod, nah, little nah, his number one record in the country, right? Country Western song, right? They try to block him yeah. and take him off the country charts. Like, you know what? That's not country music. You know what I'm saying? But Due to streaming and you know culture, nah, yeah, it's transparent. It's transparent, you know. But also, like when you look at us in the history of like mobile, like we've been we've been for whatever reason we've been very savvy at mobile since the beeper days of turning into marketing tools. Um, the other portion of it is is that streaming put us in a position that the opportunities aren't minimized, so the hustler in us. You know, look at how many entrepreneurs have turned over since streaming, you know, around the world that have started these little record companies and are sustaining. Like, there are a lot of small, independent kids out here that are making great money every week off music and merch that they wouldn't have had that opportunity before or prior to this because they'd have been put in a little box of opportunity. Most of the time, the independent stuff really only worked West Coast because of the weather. Right. Now you got kids all over the country that the faucet is wide open. So it's just a different time, you know? And I always felt like urban music was pop music. Most definitely. I never yeah. thought that. It's, it's interesting because yeah. at my time in publishing, I was always like, whatever, director of urban music, vice president of urban music or whatever. And I remember getting, pro I was in the middle of redoing my contract and two like really, you know, two executives that I really respected and looked up to throughout my career called me like, they need to take that urban off your title. All your writers and producers are writing all the, the number one records on Billboard, all the pop hits, because, you know, they were. And I remember being like, that was never an issue for me because I'm, I'm black, right. I'm from Atlanta, and I own it. And I, and I actually like the idea that y'all had to come see us. Right. And urban music to get your pop hits, you know what I mean? So I, I never felt, and I never felt like it was putting me in a box. I understand where it comes from, though, because as I transferred into being at a label, I understand how people can look at it in such a segmented way. I didn't have to experience that when I was a publisher. But then I started reading the history of the business, and I saw how, you know, someone sent me a few books, and like there were these black music departments and a lot of black executives at these companies. And then as the distribution changed, then there were none. Yeah. And it was a cycle of having, hiring a ton of black people that understood and spoke to the music or whatever, and then them being gone because mm -hmm. they were put in this box of black music or urban music. And so I understood where my colleagues were coming from with it. But that's why I think it's important to tell our story so they can never, we can't allow that cycle to happen again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we can't allow them to look at this as a trend that's happening and it's only ha like, there's, there's an audience for everything, right. but hip hop and R&B and the different 
versions of that that exist because it's not all the same. You know, people just say hip hop, people just say R&B, but they're different layers to what those genres are. It's, it's never going away. And streaming has put us in a place where it can always be there, you know what I mean? But we have to embrace being black. We have to embrace sure. being urban and bring power to that as opposed to looking at it like... As if it's foul. As if it's foul. Because yeah. in my opinion, it's not. And I also remember thinking like, if I fight to not have the urban title, one, I knew a lot of white colleagues that would happily take it. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Keep it a thousand. Yeah. Like, but also, they, the company would never have a responsibility to hire someone that looked like me. So... I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to ride this thing out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I, I happily embraced it. Yeah. And I, I understand why other people have issues with it. I've had deep conversations with people I look up to. You know what I mean? And they're like, but they're at different levels in their career and they're fighting different battles. But I think we have to keep making sure they always have to bring us in. They yeah. always have to have us. Even now you look at you know, the world saying that urban music is the number one in the world. You know, what if that was gone? And our music was number one in the world with no title, with no understanding. It'd just be random. We'd still be invisible winning, you know? And it's like, that ain't the answer. You know, you got to stand for something out here where most people, you know, don't have the heart to. But it's like, we look now, this urban music is pop culture music globally. You know, you look at even QC with the artists, like, we're breaking modes with Major League Baseball, Formula One, That's just touch, racing. It's culture. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. culture. Sports, it's you know. fashion, it's, yeah. it's food, and, and it's, and it's everything. It's forcing people that typically wouldn't do black business to change because it's so impactful. And because now, because of data, the after effects of data, how can they fight in the boardroom against not being in business with this money? It's hard. You know, so it's just, we're in a different time right now, but it's like, you gotta respect who you are. Like, you gotta get back to that, you know, get back to one million percent being prideful for being a black person. You know, I know I am. I've never, every pop act, so to speak, that have been sent my way, I've always turned down because I don't understand that world. You know, I understand what I come from and I understand the quality of what I come from and that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I can't do nothing else. Oh. This is what it is. I, I, I deal in the challenge world of people. I understand that. When we talk about um, maintaining black business, and then I want to open it up for questions from you guys, I, I think the main thing is just about support. When it's we talk all, about maintaining it's, anything, yeah. it's, it's about support. support. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Don't, the hookup, I'm going to go back to that. I have, you know, people, can you hook me up? And it's like, okay, I can give you some jewels. You know what I'm saying? I, I can leave you with the jewels because this, you know, this gonna help your business. But what what is the hookup? Like, what do you mean? You know, yeah. I, I have friends. Put me on. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know? well, can you guys? And, and so <laughs> you gotta all, stop that. We all see that in all of the the things that people write in the comments when they're not really trying. While we're here, just if all of you guys can go down and and say how you would want to be supported as a black business and how people can better support. We see something, you know, as powerful as what happened with Nipsey in the past and now everyone is running to buy his clothing and, and listen to the music. And like you said, why aren't we doing that before something tragic happens to someone? How can we be better supporters of black business? Look in the mirror and see if you're actually doing it. Like, it starts with you. No matter what's going around, like, you don't look in the mirror and be like, man, am I truly supporting black business? If I, am I, if I allowing my money to go out of the door to someone that's not bringing it back? You know, if you look at black businesses, like even QC coming back around, you look at Motown, it's into QC, into the neighborhood, and it's going like this. It, it doesn't have an exit. You know what I mean? Where most of the time we're creating these exits for our dollar. And it all starts in the mirror, man. Like I tell people every day, if we don't admit that Jim Crow work, we'll be in it forever. So you got to admit it. And once you admit it, you say, you know what? I have to do things different. We've all had to change. I've been at a place in my life early on where when I was younger, someone convinced me that certain things didn't make sense. And I had to mature and go through that and really understand that, you know, this crap this person is telling me is some BS. And I got to reframe and understand what I need to do for my people, you know, and what I need to do for my child, you know, Helping Ethiopia at this point, like, this is my sister. Coach is my brother. Like, we were 
talking about business and everything, whether we were doing business or not. But this all makes sense. I got a daughter that's graduating college next week. And he is an example for my daughter. You know what I'm saying? Because she's in that spot. My daughter understands that it's possible and she could actually touch it. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, we got to be at that place. You know, coach in the position that he's in of culture, my daughter can touch that. You know, um, and sometimes, you know, your kids don't see your impact as much because they're right next to you. Your friends don't see your impact as much because they're right next to you. But if they can get that influence past me from someone else, I'm with it. I'm not selfish in that, in that phase of it's got to be about me. Like, this thing is about what we need to do, not what I need to do. It's not emotional or nothing. You know, he understands. I walk through the building pushing happy vibe every day to push energy for success. I'm never head down. I'm never bad energy. So if someone has that, we switch it, you know, because we live together at this point. And how, the vibe that you bring is going to be the vibe that goes out the door or not goes out the door because, you know, you're looking down. You're not prideful for what you do. You're not supporting each other the right way. We all know we're not turning. Facts. We all have been very tested. Our needs are very strong. And we love each other. That's the facts. Whether this business exists or not, this is what we are. And you guys have to figure out ways to do the same thing. Understand when people truly support you, not just the money. Not and also the supporting each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, supporting each other. It's like, it's not always about saying like, oh, coach, Mark, E, like, how can you help me, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm sure you're in a room of people that are in different aspects of this industry or have their own companies, et cetera, like creating community amongst each other yeah. and supporting each other. When you have that, there's nowhere to go but up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and also sharing stories. I think it's really important for everyone to share their stories. I'm, I'm on coach all the time about that, but Mark as well, Amber, like your journey, because people are able to learn from you being transparent and honest about the journey. I used to make jokes about how I would be at like ASCAP awards or whoever, whatever awards, and someone's getting honored. And they're just like, I want to thank God. I want to thank my mom. I'm like, just be honest about what you went through along the way so that people also understand you might go through a tough time. You might have people betray you. You might have, you know what I'm saying? You might get tested in a corporate environment, but you got through it. You know what I mean? Because I think a lot of the people that we look at will only show you the highs and not show you the lows that they go through and the importance of being resilient and finding those people that will be your supporters and loyalists, et cetera. So create community amongst each other and then share your stories along the way. Especially what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's needed. I definitely want to make time for questions. I love y'all so much, and I'm sure y'all's mixtapes are fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everybody. <laughs> 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 let's please, please feel free to introduce yourself, but let's use this time to talk about building and maintaining black business and to ask these legendary people some really incredible questions. I'm, I saw your hand go up first, so I'm going to start here. Okay. Um, first of all, you guys did amazing. Yeah. Please, yeah, yes, please, you so do. we can hear you. Everyone actually has to stand up so people know where these questions so came from. <laughs> Is this on? Okay. So you guys talked a lot about um, basically working in the industry and working with other people. Um, I think what you said to a point is you bet on a person. Mm -hmm. Like that, that really stood out to me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, with everybody like in this need to be an independent artist or, you know, they feel that need to be an independent artist, if I would have met you guys, I'm not an artist, but I'd be like, man, I might want to sign to... QC, I might want to sign to Motown because I like this energy of people. Mm -hmm. What would you say is like the pros and cons of being an independent artist or, you know, versus working with you guys? I, look, I'm in support of independent artists, and, but I, I think it's always to a point because once you need the bigger support, you'd want to come see us. You know what I mean? But you can like, the other part about streaming is that you've been able to create every class of artists that can exist. There are people that are touring the world, putting out music all year long, and they're comfortable with the money that they're making as independent artists. But it depends on what your goals are. If you want to become a superstar, have your, your music travel around the world, 
you'd want to come see us. And that's really the difference. I think that it, it, we're at a point where it all can exist. Yeah. And that's fine. It comes down to what your goals are and what you want. Yeah, I'm real supportive of Benefit. Mm -hmm. like, I, like, even when, like most artists are, 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 that, that I work with, you know, unless we build them from the ground up, you know, I'm big on them. Like, let's, let's push. I like, I like to stay like, well, you say Yachty, for instance. I signed Yachty, but I stayed behind it. I, I stayed behind him for like six months before I came out and said, you know what? I'm, behind, you know, I'm helping with this because I wanted him to show his independence. You know what I'm saying? And, and he had a direct connect with his fans where they felt like they were connected to him. And helping to build him and, up. And yeah. helping to build him up. You know, so it's like, let me stay behind that until we get to a certain point where, okay, well, we have to take it to another level. Then I'll step out. You know, and I'm not going to step out in front of you. I'm going to step on the side of you. You know, so we're we going to walk the walk together, you know. So, yeah, I'm really big on that. But, you know, it, it comes to a certain point. You know, our whole thing was we the number one independent company in the country. In the country, though. You see what I just said? So it was like at some point I had to, you know, I had to find the right partner. And, you know, we negotiated a good deal. You know what I'm saying? Because we put the work in. Mm -hmm. and, and now it works. Another question? I'm gonna, I'm gonna come right here in the front, and then I don't want to forget about the back. So I got y'all. Please don't put your hands there. <laughs> um, kind of piggyback off of what Ethiopia said about a lot of people come up and they talk about their successes and their victories, but they don't really talk about the hard times that they had to go through to get there. Um, can each of you just, you know, briefly describe what was the hardest point in your career, and how you overcame it, or if you've overcome it yet? I mean, it's, you always overcome. The hardest point in my career is, you know, like, you, like Mark said, people just see, you know, because of social media and everything now, people just see the videos, you know? So there's been times, like, in building our company where me and my partner, where our artists, we was doing well, you know? But us as a company, shit, we were, <laughs> hey, man, you know, it was like we were check to check, you know? but. That, that's that whole gut, that's that whole taking a risk. Like, we believed in our company and our artists so much that it was like, you know what, okay, man, we just got a check for $250,000, right? But we got to go to the radio, because we got a big record. And it's going to take all that $250,000. What do we do? Double down, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and just bet on it and go. And, you know, God willing, the things work, you know? But it's been tough times building QC. It's, I mean, we six years in, and I can say, I mean, it's, it, trust me, it's, it's, it's still a big building process, but four years of that, it was a struggle. It was a real struggle, but that's with any company. You know, like, if you start your own company, you know how people always tell you, hey, those first five years, you're not going to make no money. But people, oh, yeah, I'm about to just, nah, you know, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> so, yes. I think for me, um, Again, most of my career was in music publishing, and I was pretty successful. I started pretty young. You know, I was pretty successful, and so it was like all like this. And then it was transitioning into being at a label, and then you're at a label with such a huge legacy. And also, there haven't been many women of color, black women specifically, that ever got to a president level of a label. So I, I dealt with the transition of there was a little bit of hate, around that, like why, how did she get this opportunity? And so that was disappointing, because as a publisher, I feel like it's definitely a lot easier. People, you just give people checks, you know what I'm saying? It's not the same kind of pressure. But also, the legacy of Motown was really tough. Like people would look, think of it and only think of a black and white image and not really think about what those black people were able to achieve and how it transcended over the 60 years that Motown's been in existence. So. I'm like, damn, y'all don't remember Boyz II Men? Like, <laughs> Boyz II Men was huge. I mean, I was a kid then, but I'm like, y'all acting like it didn't continue over time. So I felt a huge responsibility around that. But also, you know, we talked about it earlier, we were in a building that didn't have other people of color, didn't really understand what this music was, couldn't say that it was worth this amount because it wasn't really selling that much. And so it was challenging for the first several years. It was really tough, but I also got to experience incredible loyalty. You know what I mean? I, when you challenge yourself and allow yourself to go through tough situations and come out on the other side, you know your strength. 
and ability, and it just, it's like, it's fine tuning you, you know what I'm saying? So that was probably the toughest period for me, like the first three, four years. I mean, so I've been there five years. It's been a year of like, <laughs> I made it to the other side, but it was good for me, you know what I mean? And I'm proud of the work we, we've been able to do. And we were in a staff meeting, we probably have like 12, 14 people on the Motown immediate team. And I, I was like, going hard on everybody and they've only been there for like nine ten months and i was like oh shit we've done a lot in a minute like we're good we're in a, we're in a great place but i'm proud of that mm -hmm. the challenges are worth it yeah. it makes you better and it's funny like i think my biggest challenge is probably like from being in management when you um when you could take people from bunk beds to mansions and once they get to that point they totally forget how they got there and pivot to say you're eating off of me and I want to renegotiate you to get 20, from 20% 20 to 10. Me, myself, I walk when it comes to that because my value is important and I got to stand on that. But also understand that, you know, it's sad that a person can allow themselves to be swayed when they know how much work was put in to get them to this point. And for anybody to be on the outside to be able to pluck chips at what they've never built and then watch that person get in other hands and go down. You know, and you say, shit, what happened? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's that Been lack there. of education and loyalty. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a regular story, like, in our business, because people lose sight that you've been supported up. You know, not that you've taken this person here. Somebody really had to think about how to challenge you to get you to compete with the world that your friend that you just brought on can't do, or the stranger that don't look like you can't do, you know? I heard someone tell me after the work, like, yeah, such and such told me that you overcharged for us, and da, 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 da. And I'm like, really? I said, man, you were getting that for almost 10 years. How is that an overcharge? And then I thought about it, I said, wow, you don't have the value for yourself. For you to tell me that I was overcharging for your life and your family's life and you to let someone tell you that meant that it wasn't me that was doing the wrong thing. It's you and that person that has no value for you and you not see it. Because that person is telling you you're not worth it. This dude was charging the price that you're not worth. And for you to get an attitude about that, I would be like, man, my man came up for us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I wouldn't be at that point where, yo, you overcharging for us, this, that, and I'm like, well, if you're consistently getting it from everyone, how is that an overcharge? If it's a one-off, maybe that's an overcharge. You're doing too much. But if you're consistently getting this number over a, a, for a decade, and, you, and someone tells you that that was an overcharge, you never valued yourself. You never paid attention to the hard work that it took to get there. And those things are stuff that's mostly disheartening because it made me realize how much we don't believe in ourselves and how much we're willing to bastardize someone else for our own personal disbelief is nuts. So we got we to gotta change, man. Like, it's got to change big time, you know? Let me grab one of these. Who, is your question lit? Like, who, who stand up? <laughs> right. This is a good question. <laughs> oh, can you grab somebody in the back here? I want to make sure we move around the room. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, whoever Hi. has a mic. <laughs> hey. My name is Britt. Um, my question is more about using your network. So before y'all were talking about not asking for a hookup, but also talking about how like a lot of people believed in you to help you get there. So I guess a lot of this is about accessibility. How can I utilize my network without it seeming like I just want a hookup? Fire question. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> It's funny, it's, 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 the work, it's the work you put in, you know? You have a real understanding that if you put in that work, if you're bringing something of value to the person that you're asking something from. So there's a difference between you extracting something and it being an exchange. So you can utilize your network if you're bringing added value, you know, to that person also, but if it's just a value to you, yeah, you're abusing your network, one million percent. Yeah, that's real. I mean, that's so real. Because, <laughs> because the information, like I said, I, I love giving the information, but 
the, 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 the moment that you call me like, yo, man, I want to book the Migos. But can you hook me up? I'm like, but shit. I, I, but, I, like, so what I'm going to tell why? them? <laughs> it's like, why? What, what I'm going to yeah. tell the artist? Like, oh, yeah, you know, I got to hook uh, my this, friend my friend up. And they looking at me like, but shit, how many other people you done hooked up like this? Yeah. Now this is affecting my business. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. so, how many friends you going to let tear our business down? Exactly. You know, but the information, the stories, um, the trials and tribulations I've been through, um, oh, I'm, I'm willing to share all that because I know that I've made some wrong turns. You know, like, there was no, I didn't read no books, you know. Like, I have friends in the business that I could, I could sit and ask stories or sit and listen, but there was no book that taught me. It was all trial and error. So if I, if, you know, like, if I, could, I see you going the wrong way, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to give you the information because the decision is yours. You know, I'm getting, hey, maybe if you just move this way and go this way, I'm telling you, it's a little roadblock right there. If, if you go this way, waiting on you now, if you go this way, you can get around. I, I'll give that information, you know, but then that's a decision that you have to take on. You know what I'm saying? And, and like Mark was saying, just study people, man. You know what I'm saying? Do your research, you know, and don't get so caught up. Shit moves so fast now. You look for a second, do, do full research. And, and, and set your plan and, and make sure, like, you know, shit, when, was, when, when I was younger, I had to actually go to the library and, and <laughs> yeah. study, do research, do the story, turn it in. No you Google. Know? No, no Google. So no it's like Google. really do your research. Yeah. Well, I, we, have re we ran out of time. I want to thank all of you guys for sitting here and listening. I appreciate you guys so much for coming and share your stories. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you and for being great role models for what we're sitting here to talk about today. Um, these guys will be around, and um, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Broccoli, for having us, too. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great day.